Thursday. We're back for the 3 o'clock block. And this is History Lens. I'm Jay Fidel. And to my left is uh, John Davidan. He is the, <clears throat> the progenitor of History Lens. Uh, he is yes, a professor right. of history at Hawaii Pacific University. And to his right, my brother Gene Fidel, who uh, teaches uh, law at Yale Law School. What a combination. Yeah. <laughs> Heavyweight. So, you know, what, what leads me to this discussion? This is discussion? like a pepperoni, half pepperoni and half mushroom pizza. <laughs> yeah, which is the mushroom and <laughs> which is the pepperoni? <laughs> and I like, the cheese. I like pepperoni, actually. You can have actually, we're going to do the whole show about pizza. <laughs> change the title. And the title is The History of Presidential Power and Its Dramatic, Inexorable Expansion over the years. What makes us think ah. of this is, of course, Trump and the national yeah, right. emergency and other right. gambits that he has used in his administration to enhance uh, and expand his own yeah. presidential power and, um, you know, become more authoritarian all the time. And it's very scary. A lot of people are worried about that. Ah. But Jay, so we, we need to study this, John. But the thing is, some scholars have argued that Trump actually pulled back a little bit on presidential power when he, when he determined that the DACA declaration that Obama did, which was an executive order, was unconstitutional and then abandoned that. Some scholars have argued, well, he actually took back some presidential power. Mm. But then he, he made his own declarations, didn't he? Uh, well, he's, in, you know... The, in distinction to his position on the, <laughs> the original DACA um, executive order, he made his own yeah. executive orders. Yeah. 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 So he's... I mean, that's the fear, right? The fear of, of the left and of Democrats is that Trump is accumulating all this power and what will he do with it, right? The, I read an article in The Atlantic recently which suggested, well, Trump could, with a national emergency declaration, send troops into the polling places on the day of the election just to, to make sure that there's no violence associated with it, which could, you know, provide enough intimidation on the part of voters that they might actually... You know, not, voters might not show up, and, mm -hmm. and boom, Trump wins re-election. It's, it's like Reconstruction all over again. <laughs> Seriously, yeah. sending federal troops in yeah. to ensure Democrats well, win. Well, that's true, right. I mean, that's, yeah, and, and of course... Would that be? Yeah. What's, what's chilling about it is, <clears throat> is uh, Michael Cohn's uh, closing remarks uh, last yes. week right. about how uh, if, if Trump loses the election in 2020, there will not be a peaceful right. transition of power. That's a right. great concern. Yeah. Does he still be president? He still theoretically have right to uh, yeah. you know supervise the military but let's let's go back we go back yeah. to the beginning yeah what did the founders intend here and how far off base have we gone what do you call it executive creep <laughs> yeah no. well it, sure. i mean there, there there's a sense in which uh, creep uh, uh, there's a nixon era <laughs> Ex exactly uh, right uh, executive uh, the uh, creeping authority of the executive branch or the chief executive uh, so can, uh, let me let me toss a few ideas. Yeah, out, yeah, and sure. Then go, you can go. if you can assemble these in a sure. in a, a, a way that makes some sense for viewers. That that would yeah. be great. And yeah. I'll just I'll toss out a few things. Um, we have seen the function of the cabinet ebb and flow. Right. Uh, at the moment, I would say it's at a low ebb. Yes. Uh, yeah, the, and the power the, of the cabinet. The power of the cabinet, the quality of the cabinet ah, appointees, yes, well. uh, those who are not yet in jail. Um, <laughs> so you, you have that. You have uh, an expanded uh, uh, role for the uh, president uh, under the theory of the unitary executive. In right. other words, that all uh, Article Two powers vest ultimately in the president and the implications of that. So that's the second thing. The right. third is the uh, morphing of the foreign relations power, which is yeah. a classic executive power. Right. And uh, uh, coupled with that, the atrophying of senatorial ratification of yeah. treaties because right. we've largely right. gone out of the business of negotiating classic treaties. Yeah. Instead, we have all these international agreements that may or may not ever require uh, bicameral or even unicameral uh, approval. Uh, and then you have the growth of the sort of inferior officers for purposes of the appointments clause so that people don't have to ever come before Congress, uh, right. for, before the Senate for confirmation. Uh, and, and finally, where is the sort of energy source in terms of new 
executive mm. branch yeah. initi initiative. So I guess the, my question for you, yeah. that's all yeah. sort of uh, you know, preliminary. My question for you is, have we drifted too far from the shore? Right. So, you know, I think uh, we certainly have. Take a minute. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, yes. <laughs> but um, so, yeah, I mean, so if we go back a very long way to the, to the writing of the Constitution, of course, you had several different ideas of what the presidency should be. And, and uh, you know, while uh, the Jeffersonians thought the president should have very circumscribed powers, uh, the Hamiltonians believed that the president should have great power. Um, uh, Alexander Hamilton believed that a president should be elected and then serve for life. Ooh. Yeah. So, um, and, uh, you know, Adams, who didn't consider himself to be a monarch, but uh, he did make the mistake of, of berating the Congress about what they should call him at the beginning of his term. It was a dumb thing that he did, but, you know, he, want, he was... He was Thinking about what, what sh how should the Congress refer to me, and and you know, and somebody joked, "Oh, your Highness." Of course, <laughs> he'd, he'd been in London. That's right. Well, he'd that's he'd right. been exposed to the British royal right. court, so that's, he that's right. knew what it looked like with that's a right. powerful executive. Yeah. One of the Jeffersonians, you know. In, in this was a time period in the 1790s when uh, political combat was open and it was visceral. It was a very nasty time period. Fist fights on the floor of the Congress. Uh, the Sedition and Alien Acts, which then provoked Jefferson to argue that actually secession was constitutional. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a nasty time period. Um, so, so if you go that far back, you could say, well, okay, the, you know, there's debate at the very beginning of the nation about how powerful the president should be. So there's always an issue then, even from the outset. Ab yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Jefferson believed that we were we were sliding towards a monarchy very rapidly under the Adams presidency. And some, some of the, uh, uh, you know, it's like a, a pointless painting. There are little data points along the way. Yeah. It, and and, and th this is the way things grow when they assemble enough into a pattern. So an, an early issue was, at one point, uh, President Washington uh, 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 thought, well, I'll, I'll go up to the Hill and, and testify in person. And his advisor said, no, 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 not a good idea. Right. Right? It was about, I think, an Indian treaty, maybe, or something right. like that. Right, right, uh, yeah. So, you know, and that's the way the sort of norms of executive... Working out a relationship that, between that's, the branches. You work it out, yeah. and it's yeah. over particular issues. It's yeah. like yeah. in a relationship, in a domestic relationship. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, who's going to do the dishes? Who's, you know, yeah. uh, who's going to do the shopping? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's easy in yeah. my house. <laughs> For another time. <laughs> Different show. Yeah, so, I mean, Washington <laughs> did actually act unilaterally. I mean, he acted to declare that we would be neutral in the conflict between France and Britain in the 1790s. And uh, not everybody liked that. The Jeffersonians thought, hey, you don't have the right to say that. We think the United States should be on the side of France. So Washington actually established a little bit of kind of unitary action on the part of the president. Um, but it's, it's also, part of it is that uh, uh, it depends upon how compliant Congress is. Uh, whether whether you know you've got the opposition in Congress or whether you've got your own party in Congress, um, there there have always been times. Do you mind if I ask you a question? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. The Louisiana Purchase. Right. Did Congress approve that in advance? Not in advance. But they ultimately did because they, they, they had did. to appropriate that three, three million dollars. That's correct. That's correct. Jefferson was. negotiated it. <laughs> the Jefferson administration negotiated, and then Congress came back and approved. Was, was that wrong under the law at the time? Well, there's, there's, again, there's debate, as, as you pointed out, there's debate about what the, what the Constitution actually dictates in terms of presidential powers. There's, a, there's leeway. So those, there's wiggle room in Article 2, a new Article two the of the Constitution. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not as clear-cut as we'd like it to be. And Jefferson, who was the limited power guy when he was out of power, <laughs> when he became president, then he, he did the Louisiana Purchase without prior <laughs> approval of Congress. Uh, he sent ships out to defeat the Barbary pi pirates, and he didn't ask Congress for approval of that. So, um, so there, I, I think if you can see it as something that has, bef I would say before the Roosevelt administration, it's something that it really changes with the administration and the Congress. But after, during, 
Franklin Delano Roosevelt's administration, then Roosevelt accumulated quite a bit more power to uh, his administration. And, and as I mentioned beforehand, in 1939, he asked Congress for the power to establish lots of executive offices, agencies, offices um, in the White House that were not a part of the, you know, the federal bureaucracy, but were connected directly to the president. And these have just exploded since Roosevelt's time. Uh, it changes the nature of government, doesn't it? Reminds me of the Enabling Act of 1933 in Germany. Yeah. Hitler didn't just uh, right. do that by fiat. He asked the Reichstag that's, that's right. to pass statutes, I mean, exactly. to pass it both houses, and they passed it both houses, yeah. and now he was in charge. Yeah. So they gave it up willingly. And well, the same thing for Roosevelt. I mean, Roosevelt could have asked Congress to establish each one of these commissions separately. He could have, yeah, but that's true. Congress gave up, gave up that discretion. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes uh, that kind of change where things, a, a bit of power flows from column A to column B, uh, sometimes it may be uh, uh, on the spur of the moment, uh, it, 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 sort of micro, uh, microaggression uh, between branches. Uh, an example is uh, committing the country to war. You know, right. combat operations. Yeah. Uh, was it a com wasn't it a combat <clears throat> operation in Libya? Right. What was going on? Exactly. What is going on in Syria? Under the Obama administration. Right, right. We like. But actually, in Africa. But, you know, we were actually Africa, all over Africa involved in combat operations right. right now. There's no active Secretary of State Hillary Clinton went to the Congress and said, look, we don't need your approval. She actually said it uh, because it was a part of, they, they were made some, you know, some specious, some, some specious argument about, well, it's uh, the, 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 the mission is a part of NATO. It's actually not an American mission, mission so we don't need congressional Does anybody approval. question this stuff? Does anybody come well, along yeah, and say, sure, the Republicans did. That? The Republicans and did And has the Supreme point. Court opined on this sort of thing? Has it said, well, yes, you can't do yes, that? Yes, the Supreme the Court Constitution has. The Constitution says yeah, yeah, yeah. Declaration yes, yes. of War. Yes, so it's, it's, you're talking about a lot of things. It's complex, and it's changed over time. So, yeah. But typically, when the, when the Supreme Court gets involved, and, and, and I want to mention one other thing about courts, but when the Supreme yeah. Court gets involved, it's usually after the fact. Yeah. Right. Uh, and and the, the crisis has passed. World War II, Japanese relocation, and uh, right. so forth. That, that's conveniently after the, the problem is over. Uh, the, the other thing that, you know, in, in talking about the long trajectory here is right. the evolution of the federal courts. Yes. The, the scope of their right. jurisdiction uh, and their willingness to exercise it. And, and uh, that ebbs and flows as well, yeah. where, where the court has, I'll say, lurched to the right over time. And it's current, we're currently in a lurch. Yeah. Uh, that's going to have an impact on the other two uh, pr prongs of the, mm -hmm. uh, the the stool, the other two uh, uh, legs of the stool. Mm -hmm. Right, but but the the current court is filled with strict constructors, constructionists. So. <laughs> So, but pro executive. Yeah, well, this is this is the weird thing about it. It's like, if, okay, look, the, it's very clear that uh, the Congress must declare war. That, that's clear. That's crystal clear in the Constitution. Well, these strict constructionists, I bet, would fold in a second if Trump declared a war. I'm, you know, so so the the politics of this is really intense, and the strict constructionists. I think uh, have always given way when their party is in power and and they want the president to succeed. So you know, it's it's politics are deeply embedded in this. Well, you know, one question I have, and I'm <clears throat> not as into it as either of you guys, but um, so if you keep on creeping and giving yeah. the executive more power, right, right, and letting him be, you know, more of an authoritarian, more of a, even a dictator, and do things uh, without consent by anybody. Yeah. Um, are you threatening the democracy? Mm. Are you threatening the, you know, the rule of law? Are you threatening the Constitution going forward? Do we have that now? Well, I, I think we have a serious problem. I mean, let, let me mention uh, uh, lawyers, uh, I think, uh, have a particular responsibility to be up on this. I've been involved in uh, forming a new organization called Lawyers Defending American Democracy. Ah, OK, great. And we've, we've, had, uh, we've issued an open letter Hundreds of lawyers have signed on, and it, the, the purpose is not to be partisan and, and uh, call balls and strikes about you know, particular things that the president has or hasn't done, but to talk about the systemic issues, the, the issues concerning the basic values of the American democratic project. Um, and 
so that, that really is a concern that I think people have to have in mind, uh, regardless of who happens to occupy the White House. The, the one other thing, and I'd be interested in your thought on this, yeah. we always think about a kind of trajectory, and yeah. it, it's kind of... Uh, you know, uh, what is it, Foucault, uh, like a pendulum, that right. it'll, it'll swing back. And I think the, uh, the better no. understanding now is that it is not necessarily the case that the laws of physics that cause a yeah. pendulum to swing yeah. back apply where you're talking about political evolutions. <clears throat> and, and you don't know whether it's going to keep swinging like that right. or whether it's going to do curlicues or some combination. <laughs> But yeah, it all moves forward. Everything what is do you mean on the record. Forward? Well, I'm reminded of a guest we had from Yale Law School, um, Jack Balkin. Sure, <laughs> wonderful colleague. <clears throat> it was uh, during the Trump administration. Um, sorry, dur during the uh, Bush administration, mm. W. Bush. Yeah. And we had a show. He was on it. Yeah. And I asked him. I said, you know, well, when when Bush is finished, can we just zip back to where we were ah, before? Right. Right. Can we just you know just reverse all the things that we are offended by during right. his administration? And what he says is, Jay, it's all on the record. It all moves forward. Everything that happens yeah, affects I see what you the future. Mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. No, and, that's and right. I, and it I becomes, in a way, serious. precedent. Yes. Right. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, so, except so. if you have a, uh, a what, what I'll say is a radical uh, occupation of the White House, or you know, a, yeah. a radical non-subscriber to the basic norms yeah. of the American political culture, right. which is what which, we currently that, are that's seeing. That's true. That's that's what we have right now. So. So the, the thing is, uh, it's, it's not, the pendulum theory is, is not a good theory for describing history in general, much less this you know, particular like, situation. It's like a swing <laughs> in a children's playground. And you're on the swing, swinging back. Every once in a while. <laughs> Every once in a while. <laughs> you lose goes, one. You, you fall off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe. Jimmy, Jimmy. And you are <laughs> catapulted <laughs> off into space. And I, I sense there's a possibility of that right now. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's, yeah it's possible. But so, so Arthur Schlesinger Jr. wrote a book in 1973 at the height of the crisis over Nixon, and which, which was really a constitutional crisis, and it was a crisis about the presidency as well. And then, of course, Nixon, uh, impeachment proceedings began and Nixon resigned. But Schlesinger wrote this book, and I think he wrote it to kind of wake up the American people that's like, hey, you've got to be aware that uh, this presidency is gaining a lot more power. He called it the imperial presidency. And, uh, you know, he, he identified a lot of things historically in which there had been uh, a, a kind of creeping power accumulating to the present. But honestly, it does wax and wane. Um, Lincoln, of course, we go back to the Civil War. Uh, and by the way, wars are a moment where the president seems to accrete a lot of power, to get a lot of power. Uh, you know, you look at the Civil War, World War I, World War II, the Korean War, uh, that's, a, that's a case where the president never asked for approval to send troops into Korea. Uh, from, and created, from, from it created the, a new normal that's, about, that's, about that's, wars. That's right, general. that's right. So, but if you go back to the Lincoln era, Lincoln, of course, Lincoln was quite open about the fact that he was, during the Civil War, once the Civil War starts, he said, I'm not going to run things according to the Constitution. I can't in order to to win this war. And so I'm going to do things as commander in chief. And well, of course, there's a constitutional prerogative there for the, for the executive as the commander in chief. But Lincoln said, I'm going to do this stuff and it's probably going to be beyond the constitution in some cases, but I'm going to do this to win the war. And he said, after the war is over, it's all done. I will back off of all of that. So the martial law declaration in Washington, DC, the, the suspension of the, the of habeas corpus, um, you know, the, the, anyway, the, the whole lot of it, there was a lot of things that Lincoln did, especially in Washington, D.C., because it was a haven for Confederate spies, and that border between the North and South was really porous. And Lincoln locked up a lot of people who he suspected were spies for the Confederacy, and he was right in about 90% of the cases. Does that make him a dictator? Well, he did say, I'm going to get out of this. I'm not going to do this. This is not going to become permanent. Well, he okay. found a strange way of getting out of it. <laughs> well, no, I mean, he did. Uh, Congress ultimately uh, ratified what he did. Right. But there was a time there, there was a window where yeah. he was out in front, and uh, he defended it by saying something like, uh, of course, he had violated the suspension clause of the Constitution, the, the one that 
permits under narrow circumstances suspension of the writ of habeas corpus. Yeah. He said, should all the laws uh, be set aside just so we honor this one? In other words, if I honor the letter of the suspension clause, the whole rest of the government crumbles. Who's, what responsible public official would do that? Okay, we get that. The question is, what, is that a, a loaded gun, to use Justice Jackson's term, for any future president? Right. That's the, and the answer that's is the yes. Core. The answer is yes. And, and the national be emergency careful, issue right be, now is be the same Be careful how you, who you vote for and make sure you have a functioning check in Congress. Right, right. So and, what I get know, is yes is back and forth. <laughs> yes. And it's up and down. It's a sine curve. Right. But yes. I feel that if you look from the time, the beginning, when we were sorting things well, out until now, there has been a visible creeping, well, a visible expansion of presidential I, power. I, th I think Schlesinger understood yeah. that exact thing when he wrote the book in 1973, because he went back and he, are, he created this narrative which really stops at Roosevelt and says, look, this is where presidential power uh, doesn't return to what it was, okay? Previous president said, if I'm taking more power, I'm going to return it later. Uh, Roosevelt doesn't, Ro Roosevelt does say that, um, but he dies, of course, and, and uh, Roosevelt just accumulates a lot of power to himself, and Congress responds to that by putting in term limits uh, and a couple of other things, but there's not enough there, and actually what you see after Roosevelt is a pretty rapid accumulation of power by presidents. You've got the the Korean War, and then of course you have uh, the, the 1960s and 70s with, with Nixon, and a, a dramatic increase in power at that point. Nixon does all kinds of stuff that's, that's uh, not, a, not, it's not constitutional unless you assume the president has any power that's not prescribed to the Congress. Mm -hmm. And uh, and but but you, you know, know there, but then there's a reaction against that. It, it also, it's not it, it's not a uh, a, 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 a one way street. There are and maybe this is the exception that proves the rule. But uh, desegregation, Congress didn't desegregate anything. Right. It was the Supreme Court that kicked off desegregation mm -hmm. with Brown against Board of Education, and it was Dwight Eisenhower who was willing to commit the executive branch, namely the U.S. Army, right. to enforcing the uh, writ of the federal courts. That was and the right way. Well, well, well that, it was, it, it, was... What, what to do because Congress <laughs> was missing in action. You yeah. know, they had yeah. a toothless uh, uh, Civil Rights Act, and it was because of the uh, Dixiecrats. It was impossible to get anything through Congress until well into the 60s when yeah. President Johnson was willing to make the kind of strong commitments and put, put his stars on the table. Yeah. Uh, and he did no, it, right. but, but, you know, in, in, in other words, there are complications, and there are times when uh, this readjustment or malleable uh, power yeah. can be exercised in a way that, sort of normatively, we would say, oh, that's a good thing. Yeah. But the question is, yeah. is it a good thing institutionally? Because Congress actually, we permitted Congress to basically uh, go well, in wall. Something you said issue. earlier, Gene, and, and, and something you said way earlier, too, um, you're talking about the speed at which government works, and sometimes it doesn't work quickly enough. Where the executive, he sees the issue, yeah. he can act immediately, right. that is something. But it goes back to something that you and I discussed 20 years ago, and it's this. It's, it's a military I was not in on this thing. conversation. You weren't in that conversation. <laughs> we'll fill you in. But it's, but it's <laughs> memorable. So back in the, in the, what, the 17th century, the 18th century, if the commander of the ship, you know, hmm. Uh, took off. He, he had a sealed packet yeah. of orders. You remember what I'm talking about? Yeah. Um, he, opened, he opened the packet of orders once at sea, right. and he, 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 he followed those orders. And they were, you know, they were not necessarily that detailed. Mm. But he had complete control of that oh, ship while yes. we were out there because there was no way the admiral could, could talk to him. Right. Okay, fast forward to modern times, the 21st century. The admiral, admiralty can talk to him all the time. Continually, right. Right. so his discretion is really very limited because yeah. he he may have to check back with them. They're going to change their minds. He's got levels of bureaucracy. He's not really the master of his ship. Yeah. Okay, and that's because we have high high speed technology. Um, we have events moving at a much faster pace around the world, um, and so you know I suggest to you that that speed of speed of events, yeah. speed of communication, yeah. really affects this. 
Congress is stuck in something they can't act. Yeah. The Supreme Court can't act. The president um, can act. Well, the uh, just to react to that, um, we are we're a very conservative country. Yeah. We, we we've had a, a really an amazingly stable uh, set of governmental arrangements. I mean, the big the big break point, you know, once the Civil War was over, that was a, a really a challenge to the integrity of the country, obviously. Yeah. But then the Fourteenth Amendment, which was basically a second revolution that uh, changed the operating system, the social operating system. Uh, what I think, uh, uh, what I think we're uh, experiencing now is a combination of factors. Number one, an individual who happens to be uh, uh, occupying the uh, highest office in the land at the moment that has tremendous power attached to it by any standard, yeah. you know, whatever your right. standards are. Super uh, so you, you have a, a person who is unmoored from all of the cultural and norms yeah. that we've been discussing right, and that right. you teach and yeah. have written about. Uh, at the same time, uh, we, we are in uh, a pivotal moment, regardless of who was in the White House. And why, why is that? Uh, uh, World War II, uh, uh, I, I, would, I would say, you know, let's say ended basically when conscription ended in about 1973. Okay. Uh, you know, when you think about it, Jay and I were both on active duty roughly the same oh, okay, time, yeah, yeah. and you know, here yeah. or where I was stationed, right. uh, 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 you know, the, the, the ships were World War II ships in many instances. Yeah. The the whole framework, the social norms within the military were World War II vintage. Many of the people had served in World War II towards the tail end. Um, and then what happened was uh, we we uh, wrapped up. Vietnam, we wrapped up uh, 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 conscription, and the next big thing that happens really is the collapse of the Soviet Union, and we then enter a, a, a re and, and the growth of Europe. Obviously, uh, you know what, whatever is happening there, that's another show. But well, at the uh, time, it was pretty positive. At the time, yeah, but, EU but, but, and but and the point is, it's a major change, and uh, the new post-war World War II Europe really ripened. Uh, still, still fragile, as we know, and who knows what it'll look like in six months. Um, and then, at the same time, you see uh, that quickening as a result of instantaneous communications, the internet, uh, uh, space uh, travel, space weapons. Uh, a, a, a nuclear era that seems to have receded for the moment, but who knows? You know, mm. North Korea. Uh, but we're now at a point where a new um, equilibrium, which may be a, a, a fragile equilibrium, mm. uh, may be emerging. And I think that's what makes the current uncertainty about the values and orientation yeah. of the president. Yeah, of so, and, and the sort of uh, 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 NME within Congress, right, right. so unsettling to those of us of, of our age, you're a young man, but you know, Jay's old, I, you know. Not that uh, young. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it makes it unsettling when we realize that this world that was basically organized and orderly and predictable is now not yeah. necessarily any of those. No, things. that's true, and that is a very unsettling moment. And so when um, you add enhanced uh, presidential power to that recipe, yeah, you get you get it's yeah. troubling. But so you but, only have a minute left, John, right, right. Uh, and I'd like to ask but, you to sort of put this all together. Right. For so us. so the the thing about Schlesinger's work, the imper the imperial presidency, is that Congress did pass a couple of laws in the 1970s that that pulled back on presidential power. They, they passed the National Emergency Act in 1976, and they passed the War Powers Act in 1973. Now, uh, there's been presidential creep, presidential power creep since that time. But on the other hand, Congress pulled those powers back to a point where there's actually a legal framework, and presidents are supposed to work within that legal framework. Of course, Clinton began to violate it, and then and then Bush, both Bush and, and Obama violated, probably violated the War Powers Act. Do you um, think the War Powers Act is constitutional? Well, there's that debate as well. And honestly, I'm not, I'm not qualified to answer that question. But um, it, seems, it seems to make sense that uh, Congress should be involved because 
of what the Constitution says, that Congress is the one who actually declares war, not, not the commander in chief. The commander in chief prosecutes war, Congress declares war. But so, so I think we're in a situation where exactly we need a new equilibrium. And, and I guess, positive side, uh, maybe a Congress where there are a lot of Republicans who are limited government Republicans, a Congress like that, and, and Democrats who don't like Trump, maybe at some point will actually get their act together and pull back again, you know, pull on the reins and kind of uh, pull Trump back. Mm. Uh, barring that, maybe the Supreme Court will get a good ruling on the, on the Trump's national emergency out of the Supreme Court because that national emergency law has been tested a couple times in the courts, but not a lot. Well, not big time. Yeah, not yeah. a lot. Yeah. And they changed some of the... Some of the provisions of it, but so so tests of that can can the government be successful in actually pulling back a little bit? Mm -hmm. I think there's some interest in that. Mm -hmm. There's of course a great deal of fear of what Trump will do, mm -hmm. um, but uh, you know we'll have to wait and see. You know, yeah. last thoughts, Jane. Uh, I'm concerned. I I I, uh, I don't feel that I have the ability to peer through the fog as much as I would like, and uh, I'm concerned about some other developments that combined with the political developments that we've talked about, and I'm thinking here about the media. Yeah. The, the uh, emptying out of newsrooms, the uh, uh, dying off of many uh, uh, newspapers and uh, the budgets yeah. uh, for the major networks uh, in, in news coverage, uh, when you sprinkle that in, to our half pepper, pepperoni, half mushroom. Yeah. That's a really uh, dangerous nasty, time. Oh, it is. Nasty and situation. and, and yeah. of course, rampant globalization and uh, communication globalization, where you can, foreign powers can very easily influence what you're doing. Uh, and then AI, right? You know, you well, know, all I, of I can't even cyber terrorism. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> sorry. But let me Scary add, future, but but I'm I'm hopeful that you know in the, in one, the one last future thought, and this it can trips change. off uh, the lawyer's letter that you described. Yeah, as my own view is, um, Congress may not be well educated enough to deal with this. I'm sorry. A good part of the electorate, same thing. Yeah. Um, you know, so and, and and presidents can be elected on the basis of other than competence, as yeah. we know. Um, so, you know, who is responsible in this country, in this, in this democracy? Who is the best arbiter of, what, of how you follow the rule of law who, and uh, how you remain faithful to the notions of, of the Constitution? It's the lawyers. It's the lawyers. It's and they have a duty to do this. And now is the time they have to step up. Hence, your letter is so important. Well, I, I think that's right. Although, uh, and I do believe that uh, lawyers are uniquely positioned because of the, when you add everything up, the number of insults to the principle of the rule of law, it, it's just far too many uh, in recent times. But I also think that the academy uh, yeah. has special responsibility. Wow. I think academic leaders, the presidents of universities, yeah. for example, should be speaking out, yes. just as the presidents of yeah. bar associations yeah. should be speaking yeah. out. Uh, those are That's sources right. of, uh, of, um, of insight and wisdom yeah. that uh, have not yeah. been brought to bear yeah. So in any event, the, you know, the further mm, settlement of where we are, the balance that you spoke of really depends not only on the institutions involved oh. and the political officials involved, but on people who are mindful of this Absolutely. and have the ability to yeah. speak on it. A civil yeah. democracy. We, we, we need a civil to, society. We, yeah, and, civil and, society. I, and I think that the potential for that to reemerge is, is actually there right now, actually. But we don't um, have a moment to lose. I we, think. We, we have to move quickly. Yes. Oh, and we're thinking of that. We don't have a moment left on the show. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good way to end, Jay. <laughs> Thank you, John Day. Sure, you're welcome. Thank you, Gene Feige. John. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Sure. Nice to visit with you. Nice to, nice to be a part of this. <laughs>